Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Howell and I'm one of Physics World's webinar moderators. Welcome to today's webinar, Optical Frequency Curves in Space, Ready for Takeoff, by Frederick Buhler, Matthias Letzius and Benjamin Sprenger. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have joined us listening using your computer speaker system. However, if you would prefer to join over the telephone or you're experiencing some audio problems and would like to join into the audio using your phone, if you select telephone in the audio pane of your control panel on your screen, you will be presented with the necessary dial-in information. Our speakers welcome your questions, so please do send them in at any time during the webinar using the questions facility in your attendee control panel. They will answer as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation and any that we don't have time to answer during the webinar, we will endeavour to get you an answer to by email after the webinar. So I will now hand over to Frederick. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon to all our viewers from the day side of the earth and uh, good late evening to our Asian Pacific community. I'm sure this presentation will be exciting enough to keep you awake just a little longer. So I'm Frederick Böhle from Menlo System and I will present you our laser frequency comp for space missions. I would like you to thank you for joining in on this webinar where we'll show you the whole process um, of bringing the frequency comp technology to the final frontier, space. Um, so first, a few words about Menlo System. Menlo is located in the beautiful city of Munich in the south of Germany. It is quite close to the Bavarian Alps. And yes, actually, you can see the Alps on a beautiful day. Um, and if at the end of this talk, you feel like you want to participate in our mission and join us at Menlo, we'll have quite a lot of uh, job openings. So our headquarter, uh, together with all the manufacturing and R&D, is in Munich. But we also have subsidiaries in the US, China, and Japan. We are a medium-sized company with a headcount of just over 180 people. Menlo was founded in 2001 as a spin-off from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. It was created based on the work of our founder, Ronald Holzwart, of the Optical Frequency Comp in the group of Theodor Hensch. The mission of the company since the beginning was to spread this revolutionary device throughout this world, throughout the world. And it was actually such a re revolutionary and impactful technology that our co-founder, Theodor Hönch, received the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for this invention in 2005. And while it all started with the frequency comp, Menlo has nowadays a broad offering coming from ultra-stable lasers uh, over terahertz solution and femtosecond fiber lasers to complete a quantum laser system. Um, and with this, we are serving a broad range of international customers from science and industry. Today, we are, of course, focusing on our solutions for space. Um, in the beginning of the talk, I will introduce you the optical frequency comp, uh, go over then to why do we want to have this technology also in space. I will present you all our developments to date, coming from the laboratory comp uh, to the final device that will be in an in-orbit demonstration very soon um, and then talk about the COMPASS mission, exactly this, this in-orbit demonstration. In the end, we will have plenty of time to answer all your questions, so please uh, feel free to, to pose as many questions as you can uh, in, the, in the window. <clears throat> I'm Frederick Wöhle, a project manager for Spacecom, um, and the Q&A support uh, will be also by Matthias Letzius, who is our group manager for all the solutions for space, and Benjamin Strenger. Uh, who is the regional sales manager. So let me introduce to you the optical frequency comp. And uh, some of you might think of a laser as a single colored beam of light. And indeed, if we look at a continuous wave laser, which has a steady electromagnetic uh, wave oscillation, its spectrum is just a very narrow line, as you can see here on the left. Um, but as we know from the Fourier transform and uh, the time bandwidth product, uh, if you have a pulse, of light, you also get a certain spectral extent. And if we have a regular repetitive Perl strain, we get a comp-like spectrum that you can see here on the right. It's broad overall, 
but uh, through the interference basically of the, the all the pulses, it consists of narrow lines, each separated uh, by the repetition rate frequency. So we start with a mode locked femtosecond laser that has its characteristic output of the laser cavity as a pulse train in the time domain. The pulses have a certain temporal separation, that's the repetition rate, but we also see that the electric field envelope, uh, that the electric field may vary under the intensity envelope. And in fact, it is more or less a constant phase slipped from pulse to pulse. And this is the so-called carry envelope offset uh, phase. In the spectral domain, this translates to a comb of optical spectral lines with a separation defined by the repetition rate. And in virtually extending this com comb to the origin, um, we see that it has an offset uh, from the zero. And this is again the carry envelope offset frequency. Now, when we stabilize those two parameters, we get an absolute optical ruler where each line uh, frequency is known and precisely determined by the formula you see there on the right. And it was this groundbreaking discovery that led Theo to hand to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics. So we are building our comps from highly robust erbium fiber oscillators with our patented figure nine technology, including um, a passive mode locking regime. And the intrinsic stable design of the fiber lasers together with extensive use of telecom technologies really allows our devices to operate 24 seven for months and years without any adjustment or, or trouble. To control the two parameters of the frequency comp, so the repetition rate and the CO frequency, we have two high bandwidth uh, EOM actuators in a little free space section. And actually they are designed so that the CO frequency and the optical carrier related to the repetition rate can be controlled independently. And with this, we achieve subhertz line width for every comp teeth. Now, what can you do with the frequency comp? <clears throat> it acts as a gearbox that phase coherently links the optical to the radio frequency domain. As such, you can use it in many different ways. On the left, the frequency comp is optically referenced. Uh, for example, by phase locking the bead between the comp and an optical transition in a cold trapped iron. This gives a highly stable microwave output that can be used for optical clock and radar application. But it also gives an optical ruler with subhertz line width on each spectral line. On the right, we see a frequency comp where the mode spacing and offset frequency are locked to a microwave reference. This could be, for example, an SI traceable cesium clock. And as such, we get an absolute optical ruler with thousands of sharp stabilized optical frequencies. This can be used for the calibration of spectrometers to control the wavelengths of CW lasers uh, or just for optical frequency distribution. And let's, let's have a closer look at how the COM transfers the stability from one system to the other. Um, this is a so-called spectral purity transfer. And uh, for example, we lock the frequency comp to an ultra stable laser at uh, 1542 nanometer, for example. And then in the blue, we lock another laser, we call it clock laser, uh, to the frequency comp. And by this, the clock laser inherits the subhertz line width of the ultra stable laser, i.e., uh, the purity is transferred. And now to characterize the purity transfer, we stabilize another reference comp to the ultra stable laser and generate a bead with a clock laser. Now, the bead is completely free running in a sense. The, the second reference comp is not in any way locked to the clock laser, but the bead should be still very stable because um, in both cases, uh, the, the frequency comp transfers the, the purity to that uh, domain. And when we make an out of loop measurement of this stability transfer by measuring the frequency stability of the bead with a reference comp, our state of the art system and she achieve unprecedented stability of uh, in the 10 to the minus 18 range at one second uh, up to 10 to the minus 20 level in a thousand seconds. How does a complete system look like? 
Um, so we have our ultra stable laser system. It can be an OS uh, from us that locks the comp in the infrared. The comp transfers then the spectral purity to many, many comp lines. And uh, for an optical clock, you not don't you not only need a clock laser, but you also need many lasers to um, to cool the atoms, uh, to trap the atoms, to repump uh, the energy levels inside the atoms, and then of course your clock laser. And with a frequency comp, we can lock each of those laser uh, to it, have it precisely defined in frequency and control the quantum experiment. Uh, when we de-drift the cavity by a feedback signal from the atoms, um, in the end, we get an optical clock and an ultra-stable microwave output. And uh, yeah, to see uh, how it all, all looks like, you can see here a complete quantum laser system that can be, for example, used for strontium lattice cork or for other quantum computers, quantum simulators. You see here on the left, um, user interface panel with touchscreen control. Uh, there are all the electronics like the face locked uh, loop electronics, the C chiller. Um, in the middle rack, um, that is the optical rack where we have all the lasers. We also have the frequency comp there, uh, the amplifiers of the frequency comp. And then on the right, you get the ultra stable reference system, our OS uh, cubic in this case. And um, really, our devices have allowed many groups throughout the world to make groundbreaking discoveries uh, in the field also of, of, of quantum uh, application, uh, not only from precision metrology, but then also to really the Korean control uh, of cold uh, atoms and also then quantum computing and simulations. One particular fascinating example where um, also my colleague Michael Junta and Maurice Lessing helped out uh, Professor Katori in Japan, where he built two transportable strontium lattice clock. And he put one at the bottom of the Tokyo Skytree Tower and the other one on the top, and then compared the frequencies uh, with each other by a fiber link. And as you might know, um, through Einstein's general theory of relativity, the gravitational potential slows down uh, time. And so um, the upper one, the clock that is an upper uh, part of the tower will run much faster than the lower one. And uh, he demonstrated it very nicely. And actually nowadays the state of the art optical clocks they reach such an accuracy and, and stability in the 10 to the minus 18 that you can detect actually just one centimeter um, of height change on Earth in the gravitational potential. Um, so you can measure that that you had uh, ages quite a bit faster <laughs> than your than your feet. But today we want to talk about space and um, the the transformation from this really highly complex Titan Sapphire based frequency comp uh, where the work of our founder was built in, uh, in his PhD. Um, to the easy to operate fiber-based system that we are now offering. This has also sketched the roadmap to bring the optical ruler to space. And the urge towards space is really motivated by a vast field of potential applications. Including optical frequency comp inside metrology systems can push their performance to level that are orders of magnitude better than the conventional counterpart. And the new standard of accuracy will allow them, for instance, to determine more precisely the gravitational redshift uh, to, to test Einstein's equivalent principle, but also to map the gravitational field around Earth or other planets. Uh, an optical frequency comp as a clockwork in optical clocks uh, or as a gearbox in reference and time distribution systems will pave the way to a new generation of global navigation satellite systems that are more precise and resilient against outages. Uh, however, the frequency comp uh, technology is relevant for many more areas, uh, such as atmospheric trace gas detection, sensitive radar system arranging for satellite formation and others. And uh, given this wide range of potential application, uh, one can um, yeah, clearly see the, the need to bring this technology into space. Uh, let me focus a little bit about optical clocks in space. And we see here in the figure, um, the clock stability evolution over time. Um, the blue dots represent the state of the art um, microwave atomic references, clocks, 
And uh, since the 1960s, 1967, uh, the cesium uh, hyperfine transition defines the seconds. And today, uh, more than uh, 500 clocks contribute to, to the TAI, uh, the UTC, the international time. And um, even though they improved also vastly over the last years, they reach now 10 to the 16th, we can see here optical clocks in red, particular with the onset of the optical frequency comp in the 2000s, um, that they, they vastly improved. And roughly in the 2010s, they reached kind of the same uh, stability. And by now, uh, they are two orders of magnitude better um, than the uh, traditional microwave clocks. And optical clocks are also the next candidate for the, ne uh, for the redefinition of the second that should happen uh, potentially in 2030. Um, how does uh, an optical clock work? Well, simply speaking, a laser goes to an, an atom, um, an atom field, vapor atoms uh, locked in an optical lattice or ions trapped inside a, a potential. And the detectors measures basically the absorption signal. The server system feeds back um, this information to the laser to stabilize it on the atoms. And the frequency comp is then the, the gear box to phase coherently down convert optical frequencies, which you cannot count, to radio frequencies, which you can count, and then get a, a stable clock output. And um, so one application is future global uh, navigation satellite system. And here in Europe, uh, Galileo is a European uh, system. As you might know, it uses trilateration to determine the position of the user's device. So in principle, uh, let's say in 2D, you have two satellites. Each satellite has a very precise clock. And they just send out uh, the time information to you on your handheld device. And if you also have a very precise clock, you know exactly the distance to each of those satellites. And if you know their orbit, you know exactly where you are. So in 3D, you need a, another satellite. You will have three satellites. Um, and also because you do not carry around an atomic frequency standard, you need a fourth satellite to basically tell you the time. And uh, nowadays, the satellite clocks became the biggest uncertainty for two frequency positioning. To frequency, that means you use two different radio frequency to transmit the time signal down to Earth. And by that, uh, you can calculate out the ionosphere disturbances, which otherwise would make up the, the biggest contribution, which is on the order of, of 30 meters. But when you cancel all these, these effects out, uh, basically you can achieve millimeter accuracy with optical clocks. Additionally, new clocks on Galileo satellites that are stable for much longer time would ease the synchronization effort. And as you might have heard in the news, it was already in 2019, the whole Galileo network went once down uh, because they didn't update, basically uh, synchronize the times in time uh, on all the satellites. That is, of course, a big problem. So before we go to, to our space comp, uh, let's ask a few questions uh, to the audience. Thank you, Frederick. So we have a poll for you to complete, please. Um, in fact, we have three polls for you to complete our first. Have you been working with optical frequency combs in the past? Yes, the comb belongs to the standard equipment in my work. Yes, I used the comb in a project or no. So if you could select the answer most relevant to you, we will have a look at the answers. So we'll leave this poll open for 10, 20 seconds or so. more seconds. Thank you very much for your participation in that poll. So 13% of you have said yes, the comb belongs to the standard equipment in my work. 21% yes, I use the comb in a project. And the vast majority, 66% of you have not been working with optical frequency combs in the past. Yeah, that's great. A lot of new uh, potential customers to use combs <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Uh, 
Great, so moving on to our next poll. Were you involved in projects on space applications in the past? Yes, my institution is or was involved or no. So again, we'll leave this open for a few seconds if you could select your answer. Okay, I think we can close this poll now. Right, so 32% of you, yes, 32% of you, your institution is or was involved, and a slight majority, 35% um, said no. Well, anyway, biggest part was involved in space, and it's really, um, yeah, uh, great, uh, I mean, Looking at now what all happens with the cheap access to space and then looking what optical technology and technology can do in space, this is really uh, the future. It's cool. Our final poll, do you consider future space, sorry, I've got to pop up in the way. Do you consider future space applications of precision instrumentation as beneficial? And our answers are yes, the advanced technology in space and on the ground. Yes, but excessive human presence in space bears new risks. No, we should concentrate more on ground-based solutions or other. Great, thank you very much for your votes. Um, an overwhelming uh, majority of you, 88% have said yes, the advanced technology in space and on the ground. 12% um, of you, yes, but excessive human presence in space bears new risks and no votes at all for our other options. Yeah, I mean, I'm biased on that, but uh, I agree with the majority. So, then let's go on, uh, see see how we went to space. And uh, yeah, actually, Menlo has very early on seen the potential for comm technology in space. And um, you see here the laboratory comp in the 2010. I mean, it, it uh, shows the greatest flexibility and highest performance, but it's of course not not ready for space. And um, we had a various flights actually on sounding rockets, um, the Focus 1 and Focus 2 comm send, uh, system was uh, funded by the DLR, uh, DLR, and then we flew them on sounding rockets. So the, the latest comp was the Focus uh, 2 comp. It's actually a dual comp sitting in uh, just 10 uh, kilograms, 7 liters, 50 watt, was vacuum compatible, had the ultra low noise actuators. Um, and yeah, uh, of course, in the end, we want to go to commercial and science mission. But let's first focus a little bit um, about our earlier endeavors. So how does a, a sounding rocket flight uh, look like? Here on the left, uh, the, the, the red part of the rocket, this is uh, the payload. So our uh, frequency comp is integrated in that. It is a two-stage rocket. It shoots out then in, uh, at a rocket launch facility in uh, northern Sweden. It reaches heights of uh, roughly 250 kilometers. And uh, the payload is then decoupled, and for roughly 360 seconds, um, it is in uh, microgravity and zero g. In the end, the payload is recovered by helicopter and uh, ready for uh, inspection. So the latest flight, uh, this was the Texas uh, 54 flight uh, in May 2018. It was actually a collaborative effort, together also with the University of Hamburg, the Humboldt University in Berlin, and the Ferdinand Braun Institute. Um, where we actually not only flew a dual comp, but we also had um, an iodine reference. And uh, so the comp was locked to a cesium reference, CSAC, um, and then it could, com uh, it could measure the beat with the iodine reference and then compare the stability. And um, yeah, let's have a look how, how this all uh, went. Can see in the beginning uh, the launch.
and uh, payload separation <clears throat> were then uh, fully stabilized uh, in this uh, zero-g environment. And yeah, even the, the comms, they were still keeping in lock um, during re-entry. And uh, in the end, a lot of this technology that was developed here with a, with a focus uh, to come on this Texas mission went then also in our standard products, uh, like our smart comms, uh, made them really robust. Um, let's have a, a quick look at the results of these missions. Um, so both comms, they were fully operational during the flight in, in microgravity. Um, they experienced 40 G of impact shock, um, still working uh, today, no problem. In the end, when we look at the uh, frequency stability of the iodine reference compared with the CSAC, um, we can see that we are clearly limited by the uh, chip scale atomic clock, where we reach the levels of, of 10 to the minus 12. Um, but of course, the iodine reference has, has a lot uh, greater potential um, otherwise. But you need to fly then, then too. So, um, why are there, I mean, we, we did all these experiments, so why are there no frequency comp in space yet? Um, so, of course, basically, they are not qualified for the space environment. And naturally, all the comp systems uh, that operate in the best uh, world's best metrology institute have not been designed with the space application in mind. Uh, they're way too bulky, power consuming, and not suitable for the harsh environment. Um, but let's focus on what are really the key challenges that need to be tackled. Uh, space vacuum is no fundamental problem, uh, neither is the thermal aspect. Uh, we have advanced uh, thermal stabilization that shields um, all the inner part basically from the outside. Uh, but when it comes to the lifetime of components and the harsh vibration and shock condition during launch, it's acquired an advanced optics bonding that we developed over the, the last year where we actually um, solder the optics um, to, to ceramic substrates. And in general, all the, the fiber equipment, the fiber, the um, pump diets, uh, fiber optic components, uh, they need to be qualified. Um, cosmic radiation is another roadblock, and um, which, which basically forbids to employ standard comp technology on satellites. And while the development of radiation-hardened electronics is, is very costly, it is a well-established process in the space industry. Um, the making of radiation tolerant fiber, on the other hand, is subject to ongoing research. And for example, um, radiation induces color centers that increases then the absorption of light within the, the fiber core. And as they accumulate, they deteriorate the performance of the oscillator and the amplifier. And then uh, there's, of course, also swap PJ and, and system engineering effort that all goes uh, into a space comp. But as you've seen uh, just in the slides before, we have successfully demonstrated uh, the robust comps um, in, uh, in sounding rocket missions. So when we look uh, shortly back at what are really the effects of radiation on, on electronics, you basically have, have two, two things. Uh, on the one hand, through a cumulative dose uh, of, of radiation, of, bed, um, of gamma radiations, you get a slow degradation of microelectronics, um, and that, in the end, can push these devices beyond acceptable uh, limits in operation. Uh, on the other hand, through uh, a particle radiation, you get single event effects. These single event effects, um, they can be, in a sense, simple to just uh, flip a bit. Uh, still, if you don't account for that, it can mean the loss of emission because uh, your, your system is not operating correctly anymore. Um, but it also has more harsh events like ledger burnout. Um, that is when um, a particle triggers a parasitic effect um, on those microelectronics. For example, two transistors um, let through and, and make a short circuit. You Basically, your, your electronic components burn through. And uh, so in the last years, we designed space qualified electronics. And uh, how do we do that? So we built a design based on qualified components. But as you can see here, you still need uh, engineering boards. Um, these are then the plastic components that are cheaper, 
because qualified components are really, really expensive. Um, one board costs then up to 100 kilo euro uh, just for the components, um, having them, them space qualified. And what you can see here, the layout uh, that we have accounts for both footprints of the engineering components, like in plastic packaging, and the flight components, which are in ceramic packaging. Uh, coming back to the radiation and fibers, which, which creates this color centers and darkening. So as a solution um, to this cosmic irradiation, we teamed up with IX Blue, they are now called Exhale, in an ESA-funded project to let them design a PM fiber with improved radiation hardness, but at the same time taking into account our high gain and specific dispersal management by our figure nine oscillator technologies. Um, the fiber is then irradiated under regular laser operation, uh, which can actually affect um, the degradation rate because color centers can heal over time, and this is actually accelerated at a higher temperature. When you operate a laser, it shows a much higher core temperature, and, uh, and so they will heal quicker and the, the overall degradation is, is less. In a first step, uh, two fiber oscillators and amplifiers have been placed into an irradiation facility at the uh, Fraunhofer INT, you can see here in the right, uh, the cobalt 60 source and the fiber lasers. Um, we have one uh, fiber laser of qualified, uh, of, of radiation hardened fibers and one of, of standard uh, fibers. The laser are then operated with a selectable duty cycle and the output power is monitored. Um, so for example, a 90% duty cycle means that the laser is operated for nine minutes and then switched off for one minute uh, and then back on again and so on. And when we look at a standard fiber laser under radiation, we see a significant power loss. So we irradiated by 100 gray. This is equivalent to one year mid-Earth orbit. Mid-Earth orbit is, is the orbit where the Galileo satellites uh, are. Um, and uh, we operated the laser with a 90% duty cycle. And here in the left, we can see uh, that the output power decreased by 13% of the oscillator as well as the amplifier. Uh, but we also see, so when we switched off the irradiation, that significant recovery is possible between the irradiation sessions, um, just as explained from the healing of the color centers. And when irradiated with the same dosage, but operated only at 10% duty cycle, we actually do in fact see a bigger power loss. Uh, you see it here on the right. Uh, and in this case, uh, the output power decreased by 17%. Well, in conclusion, a comp built from standard fiber may be used in space for a limited time, like a year, uh, but it's um, unsuitable for long-time operation on navigation satellites or science missions. Uh, now we did the same irradiation with the oscillators and amplifiers built uh, from the developed radiation hard fibers. And to see a strong effect, uh, we irradiated them at 10 times the previous dose. So one kilo gray, that equals 10 years mid-Earth orbit. Uh, we operated the lasers at a 90% duty cycle. And we measured again the power loss, uh, or here in these figures more precisely, you see the radiation-induced gain variations. And um, the, in conclusion, the amplifier loss is about one-tenth compared to the standard fiber and the oscillator lost uh, about 13% of power, but of course now at the, the 10 times uh, higher dose rate, uh, which is perfectly okay, just showing the suitability uh, to operate it on a mid-Earth orbit. Um, we also irradiated uh, full comp optics, that means now including the nonlinear broadening, uh, frequency doubling, and the beat generation for controlling uh, the CEO, and so on. And this time, uh, the radiation took place as the ESA STEC facility in the Netherlands. Uh, you can see here on the right uh, the setup um, where we placed uh, the, uh, the optics module directly in, in the beam. The performance parameters are monitored outside the, the irradiated area um, and the total irradiation was again a thousand gray. Uh, the results of the campaign you can see here. Uh, on the top left figure you can see the accumulated dose rate over time. We actually irradiated in two sessions each 500 gray 
And then in the figures below, you see the output power of the escalator, preamp, and um, uh, waste port. We see after the first session, the oscillator power decreased by 18% of the amplifier uh, by 5%. And then in the middle, we readjusted uh, the pump currents to compensate for the radiation effects. Uh, this is also something that you would do in, a, in orbit. And we irradiated another uh, 500 gray. Um, overall, the power loss at the amplifier was then uh, 5%. But more importantly, we can now look at the CO beat frequency and the repetition rate frequency and look at the three distinct points in time, uh, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the radiation. Um, and the signal strengths are not at all affected by the irradiation, and therefore the COM performance should remain the same um, even under radiation of 10 years uh, mid-Earth orbit. So where do we stand today with the development of our space COM? Um, so most recently in the last few years, uh, all those results that I showed you uh, now, uh, under the name of Opus ROSC and uh, the ESA GSTP product, um, we got to a robust and compact system that is fully integrated. The COM measures now seven kilograms, six liters, consumes about 40 watt of electrical power, but uh, this depends on the mission scenario and, and what you all want to have. It integrates um, a space suitable optics module with soldered optics components and the radiation hard fibers uh, and the electronics prepared for uh, qualification. And currently we are in the Compasso in orbit verification uh, project. Uh, for this, we are currently, we finished with the engineering model and started with the flight model. And then of course, yeah, we are targeting commercial and science missions in the year to come. So in Compasso, where do we want to go? And uh, seeing the sometimes turbulent situation on earth, maybe it's a, it's a safer place up there. Um, you can see here the ISS in the, in the front left. Um, of the ISS, you see the Columbus module, and actually Airbus attached there a little um, platform where you can hook up your um, payload for an in-orbit demonstration. Um, so let me talk a bit about the Compasso project. It's, uh, it's a mission by the uh, Galileo Competence Center of, of the German Aerospace Center uh, to verify key optical technologies that are relevant for Galileo and uh, GNSS satellites. Um, it will operate an iodine optical clock uh, on this Bartolomeo platform. This consists, of course, then of an iodine reference and the frequency comp, um, but it also has a laser communication and ranging terminal for time and frequency transfer between ISS and ground. So in this project, um, the, the prime is the DLR. Um, there are three companies responsible for, for some subsystems. So it's Mendel System, Airbus, and, and TESAT, and then there are a, very, a couple of other institutes and um, companies that provide various modules and, and services. Uh, currently, the launch is planned for the end uh, of 2025 to the ISS. The mission duration will be uh, one and a half year. And the mission basically targets the stability goals uh, set by future Galileo uh, satellites, uh, which is a clock stability up to 10 to the minus 14. Uh, you can see here a bit how it will all look like. You can see the Columbus model in the background and then in the foreground, uh, the Bartolomeo platform. One of those boxes will be the Compasso mission. And um, you can see, I'm not sure if you see my mouse. Uh, you can see the frequency comp is actually a rather small box uh, sitting here at the moment. And uh, so the mission precedes uh, four years development, integration, and, and testing time for the demonstrator module. Uh, the integrated Compasso system will then launch to the ISS and operated there on the Bartolomeo platform. And through this one and a half year operation, uh, the clock performance can be verified and uh, we can have a frequency transfer stability assessment uh, with the link to Earth. And actually a unique opportunity um, of the ISS is that at the end, we can get back our payload and analyze it uh, in the lab. Um, the frequency comp in Compasso is, is really a centerpiece. It is a clockwork of the Compasso optical clock, the coherent link between the optical domain and the RF domain. It is really a central system. It literally has a link to every other subsystem in this mission. And uh, so in conclusion, uh, you can see here the engineering model that we built for the Compasso model. 
Um, we developed there a highly integrated system with only minimal external connections, uh, like, like data, power, uh, RFN, and optical inputs. Um, the developed software allows for the system to operate autonomously without any user interaction and only a low bandwidth interface uh, for parameterization. In order um, to sustain the strong vibrational and shock loads during the launch period and to ensure the alignment of uh, some indispensable and very sensitive free space optics, we have uh, developed a new bonding method um, that uses a low melting point solder um, to fixture the optics. And uh, such bond yeah, provides a necessary stiffness over large temperature ranges to keep the optics in place. And uh, the size, weight, and power, so the swap uh, budget, uh, is really suitable for rocket and satellites. In fact, it is comparable to the atomic frequency standards uh, that are now operating on Galileo satellites. And within this whole process at Menlo, we, we really also built up um, in a sense full yeah, a production line for our space comms. Um, in, when you're building space hardware, you need to take care of, of much more things. You, you will have um, uh, root cards that go with every device route, and you need to mark each time uh, that you uh, connected and disconnected a connector. Uh, we have various necessary um, test uh, and measurement equipment. We have um, built an EGSE that we can simulate all the external interfaces and uh, then we can bring the whole device for the external qualification, like EMC, uh, thermal vacuum, uh, vibration, and so on. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we also have a clean room facility now. So we have an ISO 7 certified clean room uh, with an additional ISO, 7, uh, ISO 5 flow blocks, a flow box inside it. Um, this is used for all flight hardware. This is all in ESD protected um, space. Um, so we are really ready to, to deliver also uh, the flight hardware. Yeah, and by this, uh, I'm coming to the end of my talk and I would be uh, very curious for all your questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Frederick, for that great presentation. So we're going to take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, if you haven't already submitted a question and you would like to, there is still time to submit it to using your questions facility in your control panel. So let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. How do you manage frequency fluctuations of speed laser in variable temperature space environments? especially with just megahertz locking range with cone. Yeah, maybe maybe I should uh, jump in here and uh, and uh, try to answer this question. Of course, uh, frequency fluctuations caused by temperature uh, by the varying temperature environment uh, have to be compensated um, using temperature control, careful temp temperature control for all the lasers that are for example in the system like Compasso. The, the, uh, the comp itself is uh, is actually uh, cooled down uh, uh, with uh, the, the optics module uh, with uh, thermal controllers and uh, we have a precision here of this uh, fiber box in the range of uh, 1 to 10 millikelvin um, that we need to reach to keep the laser stable. And the same applies also for the um, reference lasers uh, for the iodine spectroscopy that is flying in Compasso. So it's for an optical clock, temperature control is of course the uh, uh, most important thing to keep it working in space. I hope that answers uh, the question. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um, our next question, do you plan to qualify laser diodes to ESCC 23202? Um, we, I, I can jump in again. Um, laser diodes uh, uh, are available actually as qualified components uh, from special suppliers and uh, we would actually just uh, purchase qualified laser diets in that case. Great, thank you very much. Um, a question from Dominique Cass. Um, nice talk. Um, the question is, could you comment on what real life applications would benefit from MM accuracy position measurement 
that is permitted by optical clocks in space. Um, so, if you mean a millimeter ranging, um, actually, actually, I would I would assume with the com you can even do much better. Um, I had a project that uh, uh, a paper project for uh, micron uh, precision ranging accuracy using comps in a formation flight, and uh, that's something very far fetched. Uh, what you can do is um, you can, for example, have uh, formation flights with several telescope uh, in a in a like with a radio telescope uh, in, a, in a flight formation that has varying distances and then you can do mid-infrared um, precision astronomy that is not possible on earth because uh, the earth atmosphere absorbs exactly these uh, very important wavelengths that you would like to have for um, observation of interstellar clouds and exoplanets and so on. And, and yeah, if I made something, um, I mean, if you're talking in particular on our GPS or Galileo satellites, I mean, there's all this autonomous uh, driving uh, coming up now. And if you want to use uh, those uh, GPS signals for autonomous driving, you need a bit better precision that you have nowadays. I mean, now you have uh, like a meter level precision and that's, that's not good enough to really drive safely. So if you get like 10 centimeter level, you can actually use these signals to also drive autonomously. Thank you very much. Um, our next question. Do you envision the use of microcombs in space? Um, shall I? Um, at the moment, yeah, I mean, I would like to, but at the moment, I don't see the technology readiness of microcombs uh, already on Earth uh, to being uh having having reached uh really the the commercial stage and uh as long as we are not there uh for operating microcoms on a long-term basis and uh and uh, with uh, secure uh locking mechanisms and and so on um we keep this in mind but we are not aiming for it uh to to drive it uh forward at that point. It would be nice because microcoms are small and and uh, and uh, lightweight, but as I said, the technology, as far as I see, is not there yet. Thanks very much, Matthias. Um, our next question relates to the stabilization frequency of the comb. Um, I assume you use the EOM because they are fast. Did you have anything, um, did you have something for slow noise sources like drifts, etc.? Oh yes, of course. Um, we have several uh, different actors for, uh, for uh, different um, edge frequencies for very uh, low frequencies we control the temperature uh, for for faster frequencies we use a mechanical actor and uh, and for the high frequencies we use a, we use an eom and all this is combined uh, in a, in a locking circuitry thank you um Fritz's question, who is a supplier of space compatible laser diodes? Um, that is something that I uh, cannot answer uh, online. Okay, um, our next question, are there photonic integrated circuit based components in your product also how does radiation affect um, on silicon imp pick differ from fiber based components fiber based components are 
are actually uh, you can you can also get uh, space qualified uh, ones, but usually uh, you have to to apply for uh, at, at these companies that are making fiber components to really uh, make uh, the suitable qualification processes. Um, but yeah, we will have to do a, a fiber-based uh, component-based uh, qualification program here. Um, we have to check these components for their suitability. Um, for uh, depending on the depending on the orbit that we are aiming for. I mean, low Earth orbit is less demanding as, uh, for example, a Galileo orbit needs more harder qualification in that case. Thank you. Um, let me just scroll down to see our other questions. Can you say something about radiation tolerance of EO, EOM crystals? To know, to my knowledge, these are not. Um, these are not. Uh, um, these you can buy. Uh, actually, that that is on the catalog. You can buy from Exile. Uh, uh, radiation qualified um, EOMs, um, that, that's no problem. These are used in many flight missions uh, for gyroscopes actually. So the crystals are, are fine. Yeah, great, thank you. What are the environmental effects in space on the performance of such a system like clock stability? Yeah, this is something that we want to learn with this mission, actually. I mean, uh, in principle, these influences should be handleable, but um, this is why we are going up there. Uh, if we wouldn't do that, then, then we wouldn't learn uh, how, to, how to treat this. Um, it was already mentioned, temperature fluctuations, um, this is one of the, the uh, I mean, if you're cycling the Earth, you have about one hour in sun and then another hour in, in the shadow. And uh, and that makes, uh, of course, that's, that's hard on the satellite and it's also hard on the inner components, but uh, the satellite architecture usually can, can take care of that. And uh, in addition, we stabilize. The radiation effects are something, micro vibrations on the, on the satellite could affect uh, the system. You could also have influence from magneto talkers on the iron clock or, or, or uh, on the uh, optical clocks on the, or the on the atoms. Uh, you're flying through magnetic fields that are stra changing strongly, um, which affects your spectroscopy and so on. These are all effects that we have to learn and that we have a hard time to simulate in the lab on ground. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, how does the new optical clock compare to traditional RF atomic frequency references? So I guess on the ground, the highest accuracies that can be achieved with traditional radio frequency uh, clocks are on the order of 10 to minus 16 and um, the record breaking optical clocks, which have transitions not at a few uh, gigahertz, but at hundreds of terahertz, they get accuracies two orders of magnitude better. So on the 10 to minus 18 range, that's on the ground at least, and in space, I guess it is to be seen. But Matthias, Frederick, maybe you um, can add some information. Yeah, by uh, within the Compasso mission, um, when you look at the clock performance, we are basically at the, the break even. Uh, we, are, we are starting to be better, particularly at uh, slower, uh, at, at shorter integration times. Uh, we are significantly better. Um, but then we, the, the iodine reference uh, will be a big improvement of the current um, rubidium frequency standard that, that fly in space. Uh, but then also really there's also a roadmap to bring uh, other generation of, of clocks like beam clocks. They could uh, still improve an order of magnitude more 
Um, of course, uh, lattice clock, the, the state of the art system that on Earth, that's, that's nothing for space yet. They have, uh, um, I don't know, six lasers, a uh, huge vacuum system. They are, they are really bulky. Um, but we are getting there. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Why do you use a 100 megahertz comb instead of your usual 250 megahertz combs? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, the point is um, that the 250 megahertz comb uh, needs a lot of pump power. Uh, you need many pump diets and of course uh, that makes your system also vulnerable um, to uh, failure of pump diets. Um, the 100 megahertz comb is a, is a compromise between a comb that has too narrow comb spacing to really do a comb spectroscopy over a, a larger, uh, over, over several 20, 30 megahertz and, and on the other hertz, uh, on the other side, um, it is it is uh, power efficient uh, and small enough that you can really drive it with a minimum number of, of pump diodes. So this is uh, this is why we decided for such a system in this case. Uh, actually, this also allowed us to uh, have a design that has a, a hot redundant pump diet for each diet that we use. Um, so even though the, the diets, they are space qualified and have incredibly high um, uh, like lifetime, uh, low, low failure in time, um, we can cope with any laser diet that fails. Um. Thank you, Kevin. I think we have just got time for your question. So um, I'll pose it to our speakers. Can you comment on space-based use of frequency combs as wavelength calibration sources? For example, exoplanet detection. Uh, yes, at the moment the astrocoms that we are that we are using on building for wavelength calibration of, of uh, telescopes in La Silla and, and and Paranal and so on um, are very very complex machines and they have large uh, amplifiers and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, that architecture is not so easily translated into um, into a, a system that fits into the package that we are currently aiming for. Um, it's to be seen if that is something that becomes to in, of interest to to uh, ESA and so on and uh, if they they come uh, to us and ask for uh, for an astrocom. We will really start thinking about it. But at the moment, uh, we we are uh, looking for an, for optical clocks rather than 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 building an, uh, a a comp with a let's say 10 gigahertz or or 20 gigahertz spacing um, and uh, and with this comp lines in the visible, which is rather a larger effort to go from there. But thank Great, you for thank the question. You. Yeah, thank you for um, those answers to those questions that came in. We are mm -hmm. approaching the end of our hour. If we have missed any questions, we will try and get you an answer by email. If you would like to rewatch this webinar, or recommend it to a colleague, it will be available shortly on physicsworld.com. If you go to the audio and video tab and go to webinars, you will find it there. So on behalf of our speakers, thank you so much for joining us today. And we will call this the end of the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you for calling me in. Thank you. Bye-bye.